Well, hi, we're going to break bread today, looking at First of John, chapters 1 and 2. And we're going to think about sin and what to do with sin and our, our imperfections. So let's start with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you to thank you for your Son and to thank you for all that we have seen and known in him, for that great salvation that is in him, that way of escape from all our sin and dysfunction and our mortality, and to come to the life eternal with your nature and the nature of your dear Son. We pray that you'll hasten that day, that he will come soon, and that you will strengthen us in absolute faith, in your grace and in your purpose. Please, Father, bless those who are finding that way difficult. Please especially help those who struggle to believe that they could be saved, those who struggle with their pasts, those who suffer from addictions, those who feel that their own life at this moment is not appropriate and that therefore you've cut them off and that therefore they are alone in this world. Please reassure them, reassure each of us of your love and help us to reassure others and to proclaim that amazing grace that is in your son and in his death and in your calling of us to know him. Please bless our meeting and bless our reflections. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, as you know, we're here to take the bread and the wine in memory of the Lord. And yet, Paul says, let a man examine himself, and so let him take of that bread and drink of that cup. And naturally, the issue of my personal sin, historically, presently, it comes to us, doesn't it? Now, this is not... <laughs> A new situation. All God's children have had this problem various times. So John is writing to his converts, to those whom he has baptized. I suggest he's really writing to Jewish people whom he had baptized earlier. And now the years had gone by, they're starting to fall away a bit. They were maybe distant from him and he was distant from them. They were tempted to go back to Judaism or to just go off to the world and to lose that fire that they once had. And so he, he starts off here by talking about the word of life. And he's talking about the Lord Jesus. And he said, this is what I preach to you. Uh, we declared this to you, the life, the eternal life, which existed with the Father and was manifested to us. And what we've heard and seen, we declare to you, so that you may also have fellowship with us. Yes, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus. So he's writing to his spiritual children. You can figure that out later on in the letter. And yet he feels that their fellowship with each other was somehow lacking. And he's saying that we want to get together. And on what basis can we get ourselves together, although we're distant from each other, and although the years have passed maybe since he had met them, etc. He says, well, I'm going to declare to you again the word of life, which I already preached to you. And he's clearly talking about the Lord Jesus. Don't forget when John, in his Gospel and his letters, talks about the Word, he usually has in mind not the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, but the Logos, God's purpose, particularly in Jesus. And <clears throat> he talks about Jesus here as the life. So he's saying, look, it's that life of Jesus, that spirit of life in him. It is that which brings us together both with God and with each other. And he says, these things we write to you, verse 4, that your joy may be full. Well, when he says that, he's surely connecting back to what Jesus had said, according to John's own gospel, written by inspiration, but all the same, in John 15, 11, where Jesus says, I have spoken to you, I've said this to you, that your joy may be full. And now John says, I'm writing this to you that your joy may be full. So he's trying to remind them of Jesus. He is being as Jesus to them. He said, Jesus said that I'm telling you this, I'm promising you the gift of the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, so that your joy might be full. Now John says, I'm writing this to you that your joy might be full. And I think in the end he's saying, accept accept the work of the Spirit and accept the Spirit of Jesus into your life. And that is, as he puts it, the life, the eternal life. That is the life that Jesus lived and the spirit of Jesus. These are all the same thing. 
And he's saying, have that life, have that spirit, if you like, in you. That attitude, as Paul would put it, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So, what he's saying then is that <clears throat> the message, which he said, verse 5, which we announced to you, is about these things. So he's taken them right back to the basics. That the message I preached to you before is what I'm repeating to you now. Well, the four Gospels are all transcripts, I would say, of the early preaching of the Gospel. And what was John's message, his version of the Gospel? Well, it's there in the Gospel of John. And he's saying, look, that is the basis of our fellowship together, between you and me and between us and the Father. That is, if you want to know what is the Gospel, well, read the Gospels. Now, sure, they each have a different accent. John, I suggest, is preaching to Jews, and therefore his gospel is very much geared uh, to a Jewish audience. So then the basis of our fellowship is our connection with the Lord Jesus and having his spirit in us, his life, his spirit, call it his mind, call it what you want, in us, being spiritually minded. As Paul again says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And that is true to observed reality. That you may, for example, be technically in fellowship with somebody, and you may sit in the same church hall as them, week in, week out, but you're not really bonded like that. You may technically agree with each other on points of theology, but it's quite clear that that other person doesn't really have the Spirit of Christ. They are maybe religious, but not spiritual. You may meet somebody else who may differ with you in your understandings of some things in matters of academic interpretation. But clearly that person has got the Spirit of Christ. And it is that that binds you together. If you have sold your soul, opened your heart and said to God, I want to be like Jesus, fill me with his mind, with his spirit, with his life. It's all parallel terms, it seems to me. And then you meet someone else who's done the same. And your maximum effort, the, the desire of your heart, is to be like Jesus, to love him, to think like him, to be like him. And you meet someone else who's got that same passion, even though maybe you come from different backgrounds, you are united together. We have fellowship with one another. That's what he's saying. So he goes on to say that if we say we have fellowship with him but walk in the darkness... We lie and do not do the truth. Now, what is the light of the world? According to John's Gospel, it is Jesus personally. So we are to walk in the light of him. The world for us is illuminated by him. Now, it's easy to be so Bible-centered that all you're thinking about is reading the Bible and interpreting the Bible correctly. As you know, if you know me, I've spent my life trying to do that, and I continue to try to do that, encouraging folks to read the Bible, get it right, interpret it right. But the Bible alone is not, in that sense, going to give you this walking in the light, because the light is specifically the Lord Jesus. To be a Christian is to follow him. To see the darkness of this world in his light, and to see that all else apart from him is darkness. So he says, if we walk in the darkness, we lie. So remember he says, if you walk in the darkness, you lie. He uses this idea of lying quite often. And then he says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So, walking in the light does not mean perfection. Because he says, if you walk in the light, then the blood of Jesus cleanses you from your sin. And I don't think that that means simply historically, that, okay, if you now walk in the light, God will forgive you for what you did back then. No, what you did back then is scribbled and forgiven. That, that's either true or not. That is scribbled and forgiven at the point you repented and were baptized, that's done with. So I don't think he's saying, if you walk now in the light, then your historical sins are cleansed. That does violence to the, the, the logic and the sense of the words, and the Greek tenses for that matter. The idea here is that if you walk in the light, then his 
blood, the blood of Jesus, cleanses you from all your sin that you now do. That you now do. That is to say that walking in the light does not mean that I walk without sin. Romans 7, like it or not, Paul clearly states there that he is sinning, has sinned, and cannot find a way to stop, cannot find a way to come to actual perfection in this life. It is a fact, true to observed reality, and a simple fact of life, that you and I will go to our grave planks imperfect. We will not reach a point of 100% moral perfection as you close your eyes in death for the last time. You won't get there. But you walk, walking in the light means that it was focused on Jesus with him as the light of your life, still sinning, but that sin dealt with. That is what walking in the light is. Then he says, verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, the truth is not in us. What does that mean? I don't think it means that if the, state, the statement of faith, your, your set of doctrinal propositions that you call the truth, if that's in you, um, then you will confess your sins. Not necessarily. You can know all that stuff and yet it has no moral impact. And I'm sure we've met loads of people like that. So it can't mean that because, again, that is not true to observed reality. The truth in John's writing is clearly Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said that, and those words are recorded in John's Gospel. So he's saying that the truth, as in the Lord Jesus, the spirit of truth, as he again talks about in his writing, that if Jesus is in us, the truth, then you will not say you have no sin. You will be convicted of your sin. And verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this is talking about, not, I don't think, baptism or historical sin. The whole nature of the argument is that you walk in the light, uh, you admit that you sin, if anyone says he doesn't sin, truth is not in him. You admit your sin. You are cleansed from those sins. You admit this. You confess this. And I think confessing sin here is a bit more than a shrug that, oh, yeah, oh, God, forgive me all my sins. Oh, oh yeah, I'm a terrible sinner. We confess our sins, not our sinfulness, in a sort of generic sense. We confess our sin sins in the sense that we specifically do so. And I suggest you might get in the habit of praying out loud. Because that helps. It's a bit like reading the Bible. It's no bad thing to read it out loud to yourself. Verbalizing helps you to understand and to own what you're saying and thinking. So rather than a generic sense of, oh God, please forgive me my sins here, I'm a terrible sinner, I'm a terrible bloke. Yeah, well, that is true, but confess specifically, Father. I got cranky at that driver that was annoying me in the traffic jam, on the motorway. And I said this, that or the other, please forgive me. And say it out loud. I think that that is part of this confessing of sin. Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Again, the more his word is in us, and I'm suggesting that this is not, that the word is not specifically in having in view the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, including the Chronicles genealogies, but the word is specifically a reference to the Lord Jesus. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. But he says in the next chapter, my little children... Uh, another evidence he's writing to his own converts, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So his idea is that you walk in the light, sinning, but admitting your sin, confessing it, and you are ongoingly forgiven and accepted. 
And that if you deny that, if you try to act in a pious way like me, I, I don't sin. Yeah, we kick out from the church anyone who sins, but me, I, I don't. Uh, a few whoopses, but nothing, nothing untoward. No, that, that, that's not the idea of his word, his son abiding in you. The more his word abides in you, the more, I think, you are convicted of your sinfulness. That's the idea. And so he, he goes on there in, in, in chapter 2, where he says, verse 4, He that says, I know him, and doesn't keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So he's saying that if the truth is in you, the word of truth, the Lord Jesus, is in you, the Spirit of Christ, as Paul would put it, then you've got to keep the commandments. But he says in chapter 1, that if the word is in you, if the truth is in you, etc., you realize that you're a sinner. So, putting all this together, we come to this picture whereby to walk in the light, to abide in Christ and to live, as he says, keeping his commandments, does not mean being sinless. It means accepting your sin, confessing it consciously and actually, rather than a generic shrug that, ah, oh, yeah, I'm a sinner, and please forgive me for it all, um, and walking in the light of Jesus. Now, that is what it is to walk in the light. Now, <clears throat> this is not, therefore, a call to perfection. And I've noticed with... Uh, Christianity, with, with, with the truth, uh, as we call it, that it, it tends to attract some people who are sort of petty, would-be, wannabe perfectionists. They seem to like the idea, oh, I've got to work out exactly what this means and that means. Oh, now I've got it. Oh, dang, I, I sinned. Oh, dear, and they beat themselves up over it. Look, Christianity is not a call to perfectionism. Read and reread Romans 7. I mean... What Paul says there, a lot of people wriggle around it because they don't want to quite believe what he says, but he says there basically, God have mercy upon me, a sinner. When I want to do good, I end up doing evil. The good that I definitely want to do, I don't do, and the evil that I hate, I do. God have mercy on me, and thank God that he does have mercy on me. So, I'm standing here in the, in the soup kitchen in Riga, in the hall, where every day in the season when we do it, I do Bible study with folks five days a week, and then we feed them. And Sunday's having the meetings here again. And this hall is full of folks with various issues, typically alcoholism, street people, so on and so forth. And I give the talk, and I always say, I want to chat afterwards about baptism, please come up. And so often, just in this sort of two square meters, one square meter where I'm standing now, over 15 years or whatever, so many men and women have stood here and said, Duncan, I, I'd like to be baptized, but... And I've heard it so often that I can pretty well finish the sentence, but... It's usually an addiction, but... Alcohol, smoking, cigarettes, and drugs, it's mainly alcohol around here, that's the issue... Occasionally, I can't forgive somebody or something in, in my past, but I would like to be baptised, I would like to believe, but. And then the weakness. Oh, I can't be because I'm you know, like I am. And yeah, I say to them, look, the Lord Jesus said that I'm a doctor and I came for the sick, not for those who think they have no need of repentance. He is the sinner's friend. And if we are in Christ, we are covered in his righteousness, and God actually likes you. God actually thinks you're great. He actually loves you. Now, what to do then with our sin and the fact that we sin and fail? Some people in the same old patterns with alcohol and so on. You've got an addiction, well, your failure is going to be according to a certain pattern. Those of us who are not alcoholics, we also sin and fail, more or less according to broad patterns. And Paul says, you know, I, I can't stop in that sense. Can't be perfect. Well, 
Does that mean that salvation is closed for us? Does that mean that we are therefore not okay with God, that God's mad with us? No. To love someone, to love somebody, does not mean that you only love them in a conditional way while they're good. And if you see any bad sides in them, oh, well, it's finished. If you've had children, you will know that that is how parents love children, because they are my children. Not because they are perfect. And that love does not change when they misbehave. Now, when you, when you follow through this idea of walking in the light or walking with God, in the Old Testament, it's very helpful. Because again, it does not mean perfectionism. It means to walk in that path with the Lord. And, you know, David often talks, especially in Psalm 119, of how he walks in the light. Your word is a, a light to my path and a lamp to my feet. Uh, yeah, and he says, I'm walking in the way of your commandments. But in that same psalm, he says things like, I'm a lost sheep that's gone astray. I sin. I'm ashamed of how often I sin. I love your word, but I keep sinning. So again, putting those two things together, he feels that he's walking in the light and in the path, but he's sinning. And it shows again that walking in the light does not mean perfectionism. It really doesn't. This helps us also, I think, to understand all those records that you have in the Kings, the Chronicles, about the kings of Judah. And typically they're all written according to the same sort of rubric. They all start with God giving an overall summary of the king. And then you've got his life and then his death. So some of those kings, thinking of Asa, Jehoshaphat, and a few others like that, you start off reading it and it says that, yeah, so-and-so began to reign when he was such and such age or whatever, and he reigned so many years and he died, and he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, or he walked in the ways of the Lord. But then you read his biography, and it's quite clear the guy sinned, and in some of those cases, he died, he died at a weak moment. You take Asa. He died uh, from a disease, and it says, and in his disease he did not seek to the Lord, to Yahweh, <clears throat> but to physicians, probably witch doctors. But he gets a good overall write-up. Now, I know against that you've got to factor what Ezekiel says, that if a man is good all his life and messes up at the end, then he's, uh, he's not going to be saved. But I, again, I don't think that that refers to an occasional failure. It's talking about somebody who says, I don't want anything to do with the way of God. I went the way of God all, all my life. I don't want it now. I want to go the, the way of idols. I want to go some other way. Anything to do with all that God stuff. Don't, don't give it to me. Yeah, in that sense, yes. That's, I think, what Ezekiel is saying. So looking at those records of some of the kings of Judah, again, you've got to explain, really, what John is saying here. That to walk with God does not mean perfectionism. And it doesn't necessarily mean that at the very end of your life, you're perfect either. You might mess up on your deathbed. But God sees the general thrust of your life. And is that not also how in reality we end up assessing people? I don't say judging, but it's part of life to assess people's behavior, especially in family life or whatever. Uh, somebody is in a certain path. They are a certain type of person. But occasionally they act out of character. And so they do. And that is true of all of us. We are mature enough to see that. Other people may not be. They only focus on the awful sin or mistake that was made in the heat of a moment. But we who know that person say, oh, yeah, sure, it happened. But look, the general thrust of the life was like this. How much more is the God of all grace going to look at his children like that? Now, there's a number of characters in the Bible whose last words are recorded. 
And I give you three examples of people whose last end was not really perfect. Start with Samson. Hebrews 11 says he's going to be in the kingdom. Well, his last words were, as he pushed the pillars of the temple over to kill himself and the Philistines, he said, may I be avenged on the Philistines for the sake of my two eyes. They'd burnt his eyes out, made him blind. Well, his last breath was wanting vengeance on his enemies. It was a suicide wish, and he wanted vengeance on his enemies because of that, that they'd put his eyes out, despite the fact he'd misused his eyes in lust, as we know, for Philistine women and so on. You could say that that was not, to put it mildly, a very mature ending. Not at all. But, okay, that's how he ended, but he's still going to be saved. Jacob. End of his life, gets his sons together, and he says, look, uh, now, about Shechem, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite by my sword and by my bow, I give it to you. Wait a minute. The Psalms say specifically God gave them the land in inheritance not by their sword and not by their bow, alluding, surely, to the words of Jacob when he says, I got my inheritance by my sword and by my bow. He lifts his feet up into the bed and dies. Well, he didn't get it, did he? He did not quite get it. He didn't understand grace. He was still trusting in himself, in his own strength, his own sword and his own bow, right at the end, and boasting about it. He'll still be in the kingdom. Third example is David, King David. You remember when he was running away from Absalom, Shimei comes out and curses him. And he says, oh yeah, I deserve this cursing. And Shimei starts stoning him with stones. And he, that's a punishment for an adulterer. And he's like, yeah, well, I deserve this. When he comes back, when Absalom's dead, Shimei comes creeping and crawling to David and says, oh, will you please forgive me? David said, yeah, sure, it's scribbled, it's done. Yeah, I forgive you, you're good. When he's on his deathbed, he says to his son Solomon, look, Solomon, remember Shimei? Yes, Dad. Bring down his white hair to the grave with red blood on it. Yes, Dad. And then David dies. Well, he didn't keep grace to the end, did he? I'd have thought if you're on your deathbed, well, you're thinking about God's grace. Especially, when you, well, I was going to say, especially David with a whole heap of sins behind him, but I mean, that's true of all of us. We all got a whole heap of sins. And on your deathbed, I'd have thought, you might, like, oh, God, forgive me, forgive everybody, forgive anyone who's done anything wrong to me. I forgive them, please forgive me. But David is like, hey, remember Shimei? Remember he cussed me that day? Well, I forgave him and I let him off. And I promised him that he'd be good, he'd be all right with me. But you, Solly, you, you know his white hair? I so hate him, I want to see his blood on his own white hair and his face dead in the ground. So, you see, that is the problem. That's the difficulty. And we've got to make sure that <laughs> we're not like that. But, all the same we are. My point is, we die imperfect. We die imperfect. So, summing up, we are saved because of our relationship with God and with the Lord Jesus. And the blood of his Son cleanses us, cleanses us from all sin. That's the point. That we are cleansed from our sin because of him. So, it's quite right that we we celebrate that through the, the bread and the wine, as, he, uh, as he's asked us to. Because what a great salvation. But perfection is not demanded of me. And the fact it's not demanded makes me even stronger want to not sin. You see, this is why John says, when he's talking about all these things, he says, I've written this to you so that you don't sin. I've written this to you, that yeah, sure, Walking in the light means continuing to sin, but confessing your sin and having it forgiven. I've written that to you so that you don't sin. Because no normal person with a living relationship with God and Jesus would shrug and say, oh great, I can carry on sinning then. No, that's not a normal response. The response is, oh thank you, I love you, I want to do better. Let's think. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread which symbolizes to us the body of the Lord Jesus. And we thank you that he gave his life for us, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to you. Father, we don't want to sin. We want to walk as he walked, talk as he talked, feel and think as he did. Please, as parts of his body, which we now celebrate, fill us then with his spirit, that we may be like him, for his sake. Amen. Well, we've reflected how the blood of the Lord Jesus cleanses us from all our sin. Even though we walk in the light, we walk in Christ and he abides in us, we still sin. But his blood is the propitiation for our sins. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your foresight and for your amazing love in giving us this way, in not demanding perfection from us, and in opening up the way for your dear son to die, so that his blood might cleanse us from our sin. Father, you wrote to us through your servant John, that you've written these things to us so that we might not sin. And faced with this great forgiveness of yours, this great cleansing, we do not want to sin. Strengthen us then, help us, empower us, to overcome temptation and to give our lives and hearts completely to you, for Jesus' sake.